what we do here is go back, 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 back. back. What we do here is go back, 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 back. back. What we do here is go back, 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 back. back.
What we do here is go back, 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 back. back. Here we are. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> we are live. Just going to switch back and forth here uh, so we can see your questions. So first official installment of our monthly live stream here on, um, on YouTube with Andreas and Capitano, Kai Siegel, That's right there. Um, so yeah, welcome. I think like five weeks ago, we did the initial test of this live stream setup and what we want to talk about on here. So we want to welcome you to the first official installment of our monthly live stream that we want to do around every four weeks, once a month, a month to uh, talk to you guys and answer questions that may be accumulated on social media, but also live here on YouTube in the chat on the right side where you can... Um, where you can discuss and ask us questions. So if you want to engage in, in the conversation, just type your questions in the live chat and we'll go through it and try to answer them as good as possible. And then we're just going to have a good conversation. Yeah, I think before people start asking again of like about what is this about, I think we just want to give you um, an option to get in touch with us personally, because if you watch our videos, that's one thing, but this is just way more interactive and it should be in a relaxed environment. So um, for now, for this um, live stream, we don't have any specific topics that we want to cover. So we can go in any direction that you want. I think for the future, we'll, we might play around with different ideas. Maybe we're going to talk about a topic. Um, but for now, we're just going to uh, have an open chat with you, discuss about stuff. You can ask any question you want and we just want to get to know you and uh, if you want you can get to know us better all right we have one first question first of all welcome to the people in the chat um there is so altai kosova kai i think just answered what this stream is about yeah um Chimia Turan says, hello, physiotutors. What are your opinions on scapular winging due to serratus anterior? Which exercises should be used in rehab due yeah. to serratus mm. anterior weakness? One scapular wings more than the other. Mm. Yeah, scapular dyskinesis is a huge topic. <laughs> so I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, now, nah, uh, if we start, uh, yeah, when we look at the, or if we start with the prevalence of scapular dyskinesis, then what we see is that especially in overhead athletes or also in non-overhead uh, athletes, we see a prevalence of around 30% in non-overhead athletes that uh, display scapular dyskinesis, uh, around 60% in patients with or in, in, in asymptomatic patients who uh, play an overhead sport. So from this data alone, and that's from an article of Bern in 2016, we can see that the prevalence of scapular kinesis is extremely high. And those are people um, without any problems. So you can ask yourself if scapular dyskinesis, like we define it, is actually a functional adaption or if it's uh, a pathological picture so that's number one um, then second of all if we look at um, different ways how we can diagnose uh, scapular dyskinesis we have um, the four type classification of kipler in 2002 which is the most commonly applied uh, assessment method to distinguish between four different types of uh, scapular dyskinesis, um, then we have two different op or we have two other options. Um, we have the scapular dyskinesis test by McClure, and we have a yes/no method that is based on the method of Kipler. If we look at the reliability of all of these uh, methods, it's okay. 
Um, but at the same time, if you compare uh, someone that exhibits or displays uh, scapular dyskinesis compared to uh, studies that actually monitor the movement of the scapula in uh, 3D analysis, then we see that sometimes what we see through the skin is not that accurate. So there's also a lot of uh, mistakes in our assessment as well. So that's point two. Uh, and then let's say if you really have a patient that you are sure of that has scapular dyskinesis, then the third question is, can we actually change the kinematics of the scapula? Um, and which exercises should we do to change the kinematics? And there are different studies. Um, McQuaid in 2014, I think, wrote a really good narrative review. Um, I think it's, it has the title Scapular dyskinesis, are we on the right track or not? And uh, he summarizes different uh, studies. And what we see at the moment is that a lot of studies that focus on a scapula, uh, that have a scapular focused approach in rehab, they don't really change kinematics. Um, there are some studies that show that the kinematics change if we train the scapular muscles or, or if we do a motor control approach. For example, Turgut in 2017 showed that kinematics actually change. But then if you compare the groups, if, if you have two groups and there's a scapular focused group and a group that just trains the rotator cuff or just the scapular muscles, the outcome is the same in terms of pain, disability. Um, so then you can ask yourself how much sense does it make to focus on you know correcting the faulty movement pattern of the scapula and maybe as a last word uh, uh, there are a couple of studies uh, of prospective studies that investigate if scapular dyskinesis is a factor in the development of shoulder pain and there are five uh, prospective, prospective studies out there right now uh, three are done in uh, the normal athlete population, so not or sub elite level, and they don't show any associate association between scapular dyskinesis and the development of shoulder pain, and only in elite sports, and that's that was a handball and a rugby population, they show that scapular dyskinesis is actually a risk factor. So, I think to sum it up, in practice. Uh, I think we don't focus too much on it anymore. Uh, I think we rather used to focus on it. But given the literature um, in shoulder patients, I focus on other things like strengthening of the rotator cuff, uh, rather focus on the psychosocial factors. Uh, that's far more important than focusing on the scapula and how the scapula moves. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, if you you want to watch more on that i think a lot of the stuff that kai discussed of course can be found on our channel there's a in the playlist section on, on scapular dyskinesia uh, what kai mentioned in the beginning um the mcclure test kip loss four type classification as well as a video discussing more of the diagnostic process of scapular dyskinesia and also you find um some exercises on which you could use in 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 your in your rehab mm. in, in with working with a patient okay. there whose question was that to, that was to answer Altai, directly. Uh, Nick, uh, Cemil Turan. okay so Cemil, uh, to answer your question it was also due to serratus anterior uh, weakness i mean the serratus is active every time you uh, raise your arm overhead so i would just focus on general strengthening of the scapular muscles um push-ups push-up plus focuses on the serratus but uh, just making the general uh, scapular thoracic muscles and the rotator cuff muscles stronger is going to fix that problem. Problem. I wouldn't focus on an even individual muscle. Yeah, exactly. Just get them moving, get them stronger. Um, Amna Taufik, what are you guys graduated in? Um, I mean, we are both graduated physiotherapists. We graduated uh, two years ago from the European School of Physiotherapy here in Amsterdam, which got us our bachelor's, uh, Bachelor of Science title with honors. Um, and currently we're enrolled in a master's program in manual therapy 
at another at a different school here in the Netherlands. So we're both physios. But uh, if soon to be manual therapists yeah, exactly. in a year. So yeah, if you want to I think know more in detail about the both of us, just um you can read the, the whole story on our Facebook about page and uh and website as well. Uh, maybe at the same time uh, a short note if you try to access our website website lately i don't yeah. know for how long this has nah, been going it should, on should be resolved today i mean okay uh, but uh there was some kind of certificate problem so if you get a warning that's because uh our host hosted yeah they, they some kind of problems with the certificate they, they messed so, it uh, up and now it gives you a security warning but you shouldn't be alarmed um it's just there's some website trouble it's just Another fire that we have to work with. Um, but yeah, if you want to know more about us, you can also find us on social media or website and then read more about that. I'm not. So Carlos says, hi there, I'm from Spain. Any advice for a young physiotherapist that just finished university and had no idea what to do with his life? Well, I guess, first of all, congratulations on graduating. Good job. Um, yeah, it's a, I think it's a, always a difficult question to uh, put that decision into other people's hands. Um, I don't know what your um, how your curriculum looked like if you had clinical placements in different settings, which can already give you an idea. I think during the time that you're studying, what do I like? What do I don't like? Do I see myself more in an inpatient um, uh, environment, working in hospital or, or rehab centers? You know, or are you more enthusiastic about an orthopedic population, maybe a sports population or, you know, so if you haven't done clinical rotations in, in different settings, I think that's something that we could recommend you definitely do, mm -hmm. um, even if that's, you know, as part of an internship or shadowing a PT in a different in different fields, you could do that. Um, and And by you know, actively looking at how these people are working, figure out what you like and, and in which field you see yourself. Um, so we can't really answer that. I think it's a bit of pick and choose. I think both Kai and I, we did inpatient and outpatient um, internships or clinical rotations mm -hmm. uh, during our studies. And yeah, that's even though we, we also enjoyed working in a hospital, we, we knew that this wouldn't be something we would want to do for the rest of our careers. And um, I think that's the best advice that we can give is just try a trial and error. Yeah, agree. Um, oh yeah, Arno J gave some uh, input on on the, the the scapular dyskinesis topic. He was talking about Phil McClure as a good start with scapular dyskinesia. Um, Ali asks, hello, what are the exercises that must be done in an inflammatory phase for a local lower back pain? <laughs> uh, if uh, a patient comes in with acute back pain, I mean, the goal is just to get them moving again. Uh, there's not so much, that is not really an exercise approach. What I do is um, the... Uh, pelvic tilt, for example, you know, just relaxed, uh, in, like having your patient tilt his pelvis in a relaxed way to get some movement into the um, into the facet joints, into the muscles of the lower back again, so uh, that the circulation is increased again and you can uh, promote better healing. So the only thing you don't want to do, I mean, sometimes it's maybe unavoidable for a patient if they are in a lot of pain but they shouldn't rest too much so you know relaxed walks would be a good recommendation but um, there's not really like a huge exercise approach or something that i'd recommend in a really acute phase so just no. get them moving in a in a relaxed way and then what you see the, is that the prognosis for acute back pain is uh, really favorable so um it usually uh, fades away pretty quickly. Yeah, right. yeah. I think can uh, just add a little, a little personal story that we also that I wrote about on on, on Instagram and on Facebook um, because beginning of no la end of last year I went through a, 
you know, a, sh a phase of what you're describing, acute lower back pain, just local back pain, you know, starting with an inflammatory phase and then did a little write up here as part of a, an uh, initiative by uh, info physiotherapy, Anthony Tioli, um, on, on reducing the fear of in acute low back pain. So you can kind of like read about the whole story and also what I did in order to manage my symptoms in exactly this acute phase. And that's exactly what I did, what Kai said, right? Doing really safe and, and, and small movements, just pelvic tilts, backward, forward, to get some light movement into the lower back and assisting the, the, the healing process there. Also it's, teaching uh, my back early on that, you know, this movement is safe to do and and teaching my, my, my tissues yeah, it's, it's not so different from an ankle sprain. I exactly. mean, you yeah. sprain your ankle, it hurts. There's some inflammation, swelling. Um, and I mean, you're going to reduce the load in the beginning, so you're not going to play soccer right away. Um, but the best thing to do is to um, yeah, reduce your load, but to keep moving in a, in a pain-free way, ideally. Yeah. yeah, so if you want, you can, you can find the post both on our Facebook page and on Instagram, if you scroll a bit down. Um, I think if you uh, also check the hashtag uh, less fear, which you see right here, then you should also find it pretty easily on Instagram. Uh, okay, there's an OT student. We don't know what OTs do. <laughs> uh, I have an exam on Monday related to- or occupational therapy yeah. yeah what do they do yeah. <laughs> no just kidding i have an exam on monday related to pnf stretching and strengthening techniques and i need a visual example on these mm. the repeated contraction slow reversal slow reversal hold yeah the number one request nah, oh. yeah yeah now pnf stre stretching is different from pnf strengthening i guess i mean uh, uh, we get a lot of requests for PNF um, in neuro rehab. Yeah, I mean the stretching oh, the, the, to yeah, exactly. No, the stretching. The, the, yeah, yeah, the sword. No, but the stretching that we know. I mean, you take a muscle, for example, the hamstrings, um, and according to what we know, is there are two different options that you can do. You can do an agonist hold relax technique or an antagonist hold uh, relax technique. So I would place my hamstring in a lengthened position and then contract it against, uh, yeah, if I had to do it, would be, okay, got to make sure I'm that I don't damage uh, stuff here. Go the so if, if, if I do an agonist hold relax technique, that would actually lengthen my hamstring. Then I would contract it against the table for, I think Yanda recommends six seconds, contracted submaximally um, for like six seconds, and then I can go a little bit further with my hamstring, like lengthening the hamstring further, contract again for like six seconds. I'm contracting, relax, go a little bit further, contract again. That would be called an agonist hold relax technique. And on the other hand, I could also lie on my back and try to contract my iliopsoas or my quads against resistance from Andreas, for example, and do the same. So try to contract the iliopsoas, go a little bit further, lengthen the hamstrings, um, contract the iliopsoas again, and so on. That's called an antagonist hold relax technique. So that's, that's I think, how we, how we would apply it uh, or how we apply it sometimes with patients uh, also to decrease muscle spasm, for example. Yeah, let's see. Um, in USA, TB12 training method creates a lot of conversation. Do you guys have an opinion on that? Have you heard of TB12? No. No. Sorry, Michael. Haven't heard. Oh. Yeah. Okay. May, yeah, if you can maybe specify what it, yeah. what it's what about, then uh, we can comment on that. Um, 
Okay, what are the options that activate inhibited muscles during movement? Like about hip extension, hamstring domination, over gluteus maximus, isometric exercises can improve muscle firing at right joint angle. Joint angle? Question mark. Yeah, I don't know. Huh? Uh, with the, <laughs> there's a lot of debate, I think, on muscle inhibition yeah and, uh, so the whole gluteal amnesia yeah. talk which yeah. i don't know if that's even a thing no. uh, i think it's there's one test yeah. there's one test for gluteal amnesia yeah. i'm gonna show you right now yeah. all right no gluteal amnesia can stand up from a chair yeah i think uh, gregory lehman uh, commented on that that he said it's possible without your glutes firing to get up from a chair it was kind yeah. of funny yeah no but i don't know if you're I don't know if that's actually a thing if that your muscles can be dormant or something um, unless there's some heavy neurological involvement yeah um i don't know like i personally don't have too much uh, knowledge about the topic i've seen it a couple of times on facebook i don't know if that's a thing that uh we as physios or as health professionals made up it sounds a bit like a thing that is good to sell to patients like your glutes are not firing properly so I don't know if that's a thing. I mean, I can imagine that a patient is weak in some area and that they compensate. Um, I think that's that might be a thing. So, but uh, I think in that case, my approach would just be to start training the muscle in what way ever. Yeah, and of course, there are, there are exercises that isolate a muscle more so than, for example, compound exercises. Um, you can also, yeah, I think you can check, uh, we did two videos on, on glute exercises. Uh, I don't know if right. the question was, uh, <laughs> about glute in particular, that's what uh, we made. Yeah. yeah like for example, hip extension, oh, okay. hamstring yeah. domination over glute max. Yeah. So, no. yeah. Yeah. I think that's a thing, but, um, Yeah. I can imagine that that's uh, yeah that it's possible, but then I would also go with the option that you recommended. Did you try to select exercises that work um, the glutes more than the hamstrings? Yeah. How do you fix yeah. for example? Yeah. How to fix lumbar kyphosis? So I'm gonna flatten the lower back. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Eh? Like for what we know, um, there's a lot of variation in uh, posture <laughs> so I mean like so many th there's no spine that looks like a, a spine in the books um, I think that would be quite an exception lumbar uh, kyphosis um, the question is for one is it a pathological thing is it something that you uh, that impairs you in any kind of way uh, if not, I wouldn't worry about it because, yeah, huh? you know how my uh, AC joint looks. I yeah. mean, I had surgery on that. Like my, AC, if you palpate my AC joint, yeah, I would really want to see how it looks. Like so, maybe I, at one point I have to get a radiograph. But I think it's pretty fucked up. But it's super functional, so I don't have any problems. I can I can bench press. I can do anything with it. So I wouldn't worry too much about it if you don't have any low back pain. Uh, and then the second question is, can we change biomechanics? I don't think so. Um, surgery, maybe, but then I don't think, I think the options there are quite limited as well. So yeah. uh, I don't think there's a huge potential to really change biomechanics. That's what we see with exercise as well, uh, that a lot of times they help, but we actually don't change the biomechanics. If we take the scapula story that I, uh, that I told earlier, same yeah. story. Yeah. Ah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, starting my physio degree in September, got any advice of how to learn or on how to learn? Um, Watching a lot of physio tutor videos. <laughs> exactly, that's uh, yeah. the one stop yeah. shop. No, I think it depends on uh, on what kind of learning type you are and, and and what kind of setting you learn the best i think we also are different or we were different mm, in in, true, in yeah. that regard right you are more like studying by yourself in your room i liked a bit of like collaborative learning uh, talking with other people whilst whilst studying i'm a loner yeah guys the loner <laughs> no. the, lon the lonesome wolf yeah. um 
No, I think you gotta you gotta figure out a bit. You know, do you do you need a lot of visuals or is text enough for you? I think both of us we really valued video. That's why we started mm -hmm. Physio Tutors because we wanted to create valuable video resources oh. that people can learn with. Um, I for myself, I uh, I go very well with just reading texts over and over and 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 and, and looking at at lot, lots and lots of visuals. Um, mm. I think for anatomy, especially, I really appreciated having a, a life-size skeleton to to see, okay, where are the muscle mm. origins and the insertions? Yeah. Where does the muscle run? Yeah, yeah. What's the resulting uh, force vector? And, and what's the lever arm? Which movement is created? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think in general, a good approach for starting physio or in, in general is like if, if you, the more you know about anatomy, that's just such a basic uh, topic the easier everything else will uh, get because if you know that like where muscles uh, where the muscle origin is where the insertion is then it's already logical like what a muscle does um, and because yeah anatomy is your absolute base basis and the more you know of that the better you will be physiology is also a topic neurology like the basic topics you know, like no, I always thought that no minute that I invested in uh, anatomy was wasted, even if they didn't ask it in an exam, for example. And what Andrea said, I think if you have good visualization skills, that can help. Because if you can imagine how the body looks in 3D, uh, then you can reason like why a certain test, like how, or how a certain test works, how a certain test provokes. Um, I think that that's that's what I would start with with before a physio program. Like if you have some time during the summer, just open your physio books, try to uh, get into the basics. Like that's what I would do. Yeah. Still do sometimes. Silver Boar says hi guys. Just saying thank you for your videos. Hey, well, you're welcome. Thanks, thanks you're for welcome. watching. And exactly. Thanks for watching. And also, what's really cool uh, to see is that. Um, you know, Kara, the question we just answered here on the stream also got some tips from another user. So it's cool to see that there's engagement going on yeah. in the chat that you're helping each other out. And I think we want to really foster that that community. So yeah. thanks a lot for also helping out in answering the questions because we can't go through all of them yeah. on this live stream. Yeah, that's also something that I like a lot when I see in videos that when someone asks a question, I mean, we are usually pretty quick in answering questions mm -hmm. on YouTube, but still if other user users answer a question of another user yeah that's that's yeah, that's just cool to see so uh because we also don't know everything so that's yeah. good if we get some input and some conversation and i think a lot of stuff that we have learned um also during uh, making our videos and yeah it, it's, it's just from feedback that we get from our community so yeah i think now we've remade like 50 videos i think yeah. because of input we get and um yeah and because we get we yeah. All, yeah. and we got better at, at yeah. what we do ah uh, that's a good one uh did you guys watch the uefa champions league final what do you think about mo salah's injury a la madrid okay. oh my god <laughs> oh my god <laughs> uh, all right i'm just gonna give the mic to kai for uh, now to for a quick rant uh yeah no i don't know i don't want to lose you as a follower <laughs> no yeah yeah of course we watched the final i mean i'm a bayern munich supporter you can so you can imagine how happy i am uh, that uh, real won the title i mean congrats to you guys um yeah and also it sucks for for um kloppo jürgen klopp yeah. liverpool's coach so we were yeah. actually supporting liverpool to be honest but anyways i think yeah i mean the when i saw the injury from salah i told andreas directly that i'm pretty sure that he injured his ac the tossy, right? i had exactly yeah i think he just had a strain because they expect okay. him to be back in like three or four weeks i had the exact same injury like salah and it was also during soccer fell on my shoulder uh dislocated my ac joint i think it was a rockwood type three or four injury that i had tossy three that that's what i know i got surgery for it back then so i was out for think three months uh, I hope that doesn't happen to Salah great player would love to see him at the World Cup I think that's about it we made a meme about about the oh, game yeah. oh god yeah <laughs> but that was horrible yeah. yeah so another not so shiny moment for 
German soccer players. Anyways, um, let's see. Thanks for all the video that you guys are uploading on YouTube. Helps a lot of my starting. You're going to be finding your PT student. And do you guys have any suggestions on research study title? We get a lot of those questions on what people can do for their bachelor's thesis. Um, Just do what you're interested yeah, in. I exactly. mean, a, a master's thesis or bachelor's thesis is always a huge project. So if you don't like what you're researching, then it's pretty yeah. hard. Then it's a lot of work and it feels like a lot of work. So just pick a topic that you're really interested in um, because then your curiosity about what's happening is just carrying you through the whole project. Um, yeah, and, and maybe also pick a topic where you want to be an expert in. If you really like the shoulder joint, then uh, specialize or focus on a topic about the shoulder. Um, this is how you generate some depth in your um, in your basic education. Yeah. Uh, what's that? There's some. Can you talk about criteria for return to sport in ankle sprain? I think that depends on uh, the severity of your ankle sprain. Usually, a light sprain. You know, your back should be back within uh, three, four weeks to normal activity. Um, but I think return to sport criteria. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. Depends on the sport. The best answer we can give is uh, we are trying to shoot some videos uh, with a sports physio as well. <laughs> so she knows a bit more about return to play criteria and return to play testing that, than we do. Um, the only thing that I know is you also have to look at, um, yeah, the limitations of those tests. So if someone can complete certain return to play criteria, uh, doesn't mean that he will be injury free. So the predictive validity of those, uh, return to play criteria are also pretty limited. So what I do personally is, I mean, I try to, um, basically uh, mimic in my stuff that a player for example a soccer player will have to do on the field um, so a lot of jumping uh, turning around this is what i would mimic through my rehab and if the player is able to do that um, i would encourage him to uh, start in a graded manner also to start training on the field again um, so that's what I do personally, but I think, there's, yeah. And there, I think there's also... I think we have to uh, switch the, or turn the camera a little bit because yeah. you're out of the picture. Yeah. Okay. There is uh, also a paper. There was a paper by the FIFA from the, I think, was it from Aspetar? It was on, on return to play uh, criteria for, for ankle sprains. Um, but I think also what one big factor is um, is the psychological readiness of a player with that with any um, yeah. with any uh, injury of returning to play yeah. right um, are they apprehensive mentally are they mentally ready to return back to their yeah. sport have confidence in in their yeah. rehab and yeah. so maybe yeah, capacity yeah, yeah. yeah. if uh, any sports physiotherapists are watching Kirsten <laughs> is she just, watching uh, if, hey, if Kirsten. you're watching uh, <laughs> Just uh, post in the comments if you know about any specific uh, return to play criteria. Would be nice to have some discussion again. All right, there we go. TB12 training method is created by Tom Brady, who is the quarterback of New England Patriots and his trainer, oh, Alex Guerrero. Yeah. I've seen a video about the stuff that they <laughs> do, but I don't remember. Uh, yeah. I did. I thought as, M as MVP quarterback, you should yeah. have enough money. Uh, you don't no, but he, he, I think, yeah, oh, man, my cousin sent me that video about his rehab uh, program. I don't, I yeah. don't remember the details. Yeah, you know, I think in general, I mean, what you see is a lot of professional athletes. They do a lot of stuff that they believe in as well. It doesn't have to mean that it's the most sophisticated and the best rehab. So if you just look at the uh, Summer Olympics in Rio, I mean, there were like millions of athletes with cupping 
or with kinesio tape and that has super limited evidence so doesn't mean that it's you know that necessarily the best physios work in with uh, elite athletes i mean uh, talk to adam meekins about it <laughs> he will rant about it um so i think oftentimes it's also what uh what an athlete believes in and if it works for them fine but uh can't really say much about the details of the TB12 method without, without knowing the details. Which, which, nah, that just wouldn't be a qualified answer from my side. Uh. Um, Physiotutors and Athlean X. <laughs> no, better than Athlean X. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Just got to catch up on the subs count. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, I remember we got a lot of shit from another user <laughs> for shirtless videos yeah, no that as well but uh he told told me that uh athlean x was so much better than our channel it's so different i mean he does cool stuff i think it's way more focused on uh the bodybuilding uh audience i guess mm -hmm. and uh, i think he's a great guy should we answer a german question yeah sure Okay, vielen Dank für eure hilfreichen Videos in YouTube. Könnt ihr mir ein Buch empfehlen, der sich zur Rehabilitation der Wirbelsäule fokussiert? Viele Grüße, Johannes. Mm. Reha der Wirbelsäule. Okay, that, maybe to just translated for yeah. the English audience. Is there a book that we can recommend for rehab of the spine? Not really. Like, we don't have any book that we use, to be honest. Um, no. I mean, it's, what we do is based a lot on articles. Yeah, I think for, for sorry to answer the question, I think for you, there might be, um, it's by uh, the Thieme Verlag. It's called um, Clinical Patterns uh, in yeah. Manual Therapy uh, or Klinische yeah. Muster in der Manuellen Therapie. Um, just going to quickly answer this in German for him and then translate. Also Klinische Muster in der Manuellen Therapie vom Thieme Verlag. Um, ist, glaube ich, so das Buch, was sich im deutschsprachigen Raum am meisten mit Therapie der Wirbelsäule fokussiert ja, und, dir, auch und dir auch viel äh, Hintergrundinformationen gibt über äh, generell Wirbelsäulenanatomie, Physiologie etc. Also vom Team Verlag Klinische Muster der manuellen Therapie. Mhm. So, yeah, there was a, there's a book, Clinical Patterns in, in Manual Therapy by the Team Publisher, uh, but I think it's, it only exists in, in, in German mhm. language. Yeah. The thing is, uh, I don't know about you, but like when we finished our bachelor's program, we didn't really feel or I didn't really feel I have sufficient knowledge about rehabbing the spine. So for anyone who sees a lot of back patients, and that's a lot of us, um, I'd recommend doing an additional program. That's why we decided to do a manual therapy master's. Not so much about big because of m mobilization or manipulation techniques, but way more about It's way more about clinical reasoning in the region of the spine. I mean, the anatomy is complicated. Um, it's just a complicated region. So I think, yeah, I work completely different than... Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. Than, uh, ...than two years ago. So yeah. Yeah, if you use manipulations or not, that yeah, that's a whole other topic. But uh, yeah, I'd recommend... Uh, or uh, in, in Germany, I'd just recommend a Maitland... Uh, Yeah. Uh, program just for more for the re clinical reasoning than for the techniques. Yeah. 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 You both are very muscular. So for becoming a good physio, you need to be muscular. I mean, for some healthy patients, you do need high energy and strength to help them in some exercises. No, I say you don't have to be muscular no. as a physio. It's just we both enjoy um, bodybuilding, so to say. Uh, working out in the gym and, and, and living a pretty healthy lifestyle. So I think that's just the consequence of that. I think um, it's just, you know, it, it might help if you fit yourself. You don't have to be big or anything. It's maybe a good placebo for your patient. And I'm convinced that if you are promoting health, you should more or less uh, live a or lead by example. So you should more or less live a healthy lifestyle as well. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean that uh, I think uh, my lifestyle is like 80% healthy. Everyone has their 20% of guilt. Yeah, things. Yeah. I mean, I like to drink wine and beer. So but whatever. But yeah, 
I mean, you kind of have to le lead by example. I don't, I wouldn't, I don't find anyone trustworthy that lives like a very unhealthy lifestyle and I'm their patient. So, you know, I think it's, yeah, I, would, I just trust them a little bit less. Yeah, and of course, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't harm to to yeah. know how to do stuff in the gym exactly. if, as a yeah. physio, right? If you can show, I feel like you, the exercises you show, even to uh, like maybe elite or sub elite sports people, I mean, if you can show them exercise and you can do them, uh, yeah, that's just a good thing. I mean, if you can show it, yeah, I don't know. That's that's how how I work in practice. Okay, so there's a discussion going on whether RICER or RICE, so the acronym for rest, I, uh, ice, compress, elevate, if it's outdated or not. Oh, I mean, we recently published, um, I think it's, did we, I don't even I know if we published it on Facebook on today. On yes, uh, today. We, pu we published on it on Instagram for sure. And that was um, an ankle rehab guideline or an update of an ankle uh, sprain guideline. It's right here. And they don't recommend it anymore, I think, right? They don't recommend it. All the, yeah, there is um, there is a part where that in in a very acute stage that in the article they say that that uh, icing can help the patient bring down pain and and get to um, ADLs. Uh, quicker but I think from a physiological standpoint the, the, the icing part is not recommended anymore we talk about hot ice um, so yeah but the, the guideline in their conclusion stated as not recommended yeah, yeah what I'm asking myself uh, all the time with the, the icing part and the in, in general that the, the price and the rice and the police is uh, how much sense does it make to interrupt the body's natural healing process? So that's that's something that I question myself all the time. And I think there was this other research that a couple of other social media pages posted with early rehab versus delayed rehab. And I think evidence is pointing toward uh, early rehab basically for all types of injuries. So you might want to ask yourself, if it's not better to start rehab really soon to start moving instead of the typical rest price elevation whatever um i mean personally i just apply common sense i mean if, if i have an ankle sprain i wouldn't run around i try to have some rest but to try to move my ankle uh do ankle circles for example so that's that's how I'd start, and I think it, in the end, it most probably doesn't make a huge difference, no. like if you if you apply ice or not. Yeah. Former ESP student, ESP student here, William Franklin, <laughs> and I was wondering if you guys think of a master's in physiotherapy is truly necessary or a postgraduate certificate sufficient. I think I said in the beginning, both of us are super happy that we continued doing three years of part-time masters, just for the fact that we feel we are more complete physios have a broader understanding better clinical reasoning and, and we feel yeah better prepared for uh, uh, the working I, honestly i think it's it should be a must to be honest yeah. um i mean it, it also completely depends on what kind of type you are some people just finish their bachelor's degree and then they don't read any scientific papers anymore at all i mean that's that's like the the one extreme um I feel like where the profession should go and is going uh, in the future, if we, if we as a profession want to be taken seriously and if we want to be respected and if we want to deliver the best care we can, then I think everyone should have uh, a master's title because then, then we can really also talk to doctors, for example, or other health professionals on the same level and yeah i think where it's going with physio is a bit into the direction of how it's how it is in the us 
that you have uh, a doctor's degree and you have PT assistance. I think this is something that I could imagine that someone with a master's degree um, is something like a case manager for a patient and a PT assistant is doing an exercise program for them. So yeah, I can, yeah, I can highly recommend it. Um, unless you're extremely motivated, you read a lot of articles, you're active on social media, but it's always a sounding board, like a master's because you have to do exams, you have experienced physios uh, that give you feedback that kind of direct your learning as well. So I don't think that you can have the same effect on your own. Yeah. No. Uh, maybe like two more running in for an hour, a good hour. Um, what exercises can we prescribe for a post op two years ACL reconstruction with knee extension lack? Um, okay. Yeah, I think common problem or something that so sort of exercises post ACL reconstructions, but already two years with knee extension lack. Yeah, then I think your physio or you didn't do a good job, to be honest, because that's the first thing that you should Target, yeah. Yeah, you should achieve it. Uh, I'm not really sure if it's three or six weeks, but uh, you should have full extension as soon as possible after ACL uh, reconstruction. Yeah. Especially because that's something you can work on in super low load environments straight from the beginning um, yeah. before you go all in also on, on, on strengthening. Um, yeah. And I mean, there's there's a ton. Didn't Shane yeah. Physio post like a, a video series on, on knee extension post ACL? Yeah, I think the prehab guys did that as well. So, um, I mean, if we go into details, you can do backward walking on a treadmill. You can do backward cycling on a bike. Um, you can just uh, place a towel under your heel, uh, basically lie in bed, so gravity will uh, extend your knee. Um, you can go see a physio or manual therapist who will help you passively to increase that extension. Um, you can do, you can lie in prone on a treatment bench with a weight on your ankle, uh, so again gravity pull your knee into extension. Uh, there are a lot of different ways, so I mean uh, Google will help for sure. We haven't done any videos, I think. Not yet, that. no. I mean, but I think something we yeah. we Shane we, Physio yeah. and the, the yeah. prehab guys. Yeah. yeah, I can't find it right now. They post a lot. Um, let's see. Let's go all the way down. There was also a question about multifidy. Uh, I think so. I don't know where it was. I think I caught it in the eye. Uh, oh yeah, Kilian the Koning. What's your opinion about the importance of the activation of the multifidus and transversus abdominis in a non-specific low back pain? Did yeah, we also. Uh, what's your opinion about the importance of the activation? Mm. Yeah, I think that's uh, the whole uh, early O'Sullivan research that's yeah pretty much been retracted. I mean, you see that there's a, a, an altered movement in patients who have low back pain, but that the the, the underlying cause of the non-specific low back pain probably is not the uh, or a difficulty in the recruitment of these two muscles. I think they've been falsely uh, called the villain in the development of chronic low back pain. Yeah, I mean, you, you're so, talking about a specific. I mean, that's first of all, I think that's a, a huge group. I think what you mean is uh, the people with a motor control impairment and um, there's also such a thing if you um, look at those people what they what you see is that they use a lot of co-contraction and what you see is they use less or they that their multifidy and transfers of dominus is activated uh, too late and you can also see in MRIs that sometimes they have atrophy of those muscles mm, I think 
it's also such a thing where you train I think if you read the, a really good article on that is uh, from E.L. Lederman in 2012, yeah, man, yeah. 11, he wrote uh, seven reasons why uh, training the multifidy and the transverse abdominis uh, is not as or like what, what the limitations of that are. Um, what I ask myself is often um, yeah, there's two options. You can train a multifidy and a transverse abdominis. And then what you see is in a lot of research is they don't change at all. Like there's no different firing or no earlier firing, but the patients get better. That's one thing. And now I think the research is more going towards, uh, relaxing that co-contraction again, because this is basically where O'Sullivan is going towards now that he's, they don't train the, uh, abdominus anymore they focus more on relaxing that co-contraction um, i think what i do in practice is i do uh, motor control exercises in the beginning but i don't focus too much on the co-contraction anymore so i rather focus on uh, fine motor control like the the pelvic tilt uh, i think yeah we made a video about the uh, uh, how's it, uh what, what's his name on the uh, patterns from Luo Mayoki that's a that's a good thing to do like that's six different movements and you can see if your patient is struggling with that and you can um, make an exercise program out of that directly so I just focus on fine movements so that's basically also motor control where you use the multifidy and the transverse abdominis but I personally don't focus too much on the on the co-contraction anymore. So I think uh, we see more people that have too much co-contraction and that should let go of that um, stiffening of the uh, of the core than the other way around. Hope that explains your your question a bit or how we see it. Um, yeah, something that okay, there's. One uh, one comment. I am a physiotherapist and I worked in the USA. Would like to translate to Turkish your video because your Turkish translator doing wrongly translate. Oh. Can you write your email address? Okay, sin c n t r k e. Um, our YouTube channel is open to um, contributions from our community. So anyone who has a YouTube account or and is um, willing to subscribe uh, to write subtitles can do so so uh, on any video i think there must have been a, a turkish follower who was eager to write subtitles but we can't control these subtitles this is just uh, a feature that's um because yeah, our turkish sucks yeah so. our turkish is pretty yeah. pretty subpar let's say so um if you go on one of our videos um um then there's like a the little cog wheel on the in the bottom right corner no different go on any of our video and click open the video description and then there you will see a message which says um, find out how you can write subtitles and help people understand uh, from different countries understand our videos and there's a link click on that link and it will explain to you how you can contribute the subtitles and you may also edit um, published subtitles so um, you can you know con um, correct what the other user has done so again any mm -hmm. video on our channel click in the video description and there's a link on how you can um, it will explain to you in detail how the process works of submitting subtitles to our channel maybe a quick a quick shout out here um, if you have the time and if you want to help us with physio tutors and you it doesn't matter which language you speak but if you want and if you can um, contribute subtitles to our videos it would really help out a lot of people worldwide in having access to our content so just check the video description in any of our videos yeah. maybe another uh, shout out in our interest and in your interest as well um, we had a couple of students reaching out uh, 
to us and they uh, uh, they try to um, first of all uh, get our book promoted at their university so that's something that we of course are trying to yeah we are striving for corporations with different schools uh, we are cooperating with different schools here in the Netherlands that are putting our book on the literature list uh, another school in Australia so if you uh, are also interested in a discount for our book uh, then go and see your deacon at uh, uh, at school talk to them if you have our book and you like it and you think it's valuable um, and maybe we can work together with your school and offer uh, a special deal for uh, students from your school for uh, yeah, a limited uh, amount of time same story with the app uh, the app can be bought for 50 percent of the price if your educational institution buys 20 plus apps so if you think that the app would be valuable go approach your school your educational institution if they buy a package and it's completely controlled by google or by apple so we don't have any influence on that uh, then you'll be able to get the app for half the price. So, yeah. Okay, there was one last question, um, which can also give you, can you tell me more on stroke rehabilitation? Again, it's a, to not say too much, maybe there's going to be something in the future on more neuro, uh, yeah, neuro related content, uh, which will also involve stroke rehabilitation. Um, yeah. But I think we answered that in, la in the last live stream also. We are not too experienced in the neurological field, so... Oh. Uh, but maybe there's going to be something in the future. All right. Um, something coming in. What can cause pelvis to anterior tilt just on one side and how to fix it? The, yeah that's again the pelvic torsion yeah yeah that's also a thing again that is really hard to measure reliably and and i know a lot of physios tell that to patients that their pelvis is twisted or anything like that but it's extremely hard to measure and then uh, i think even with uh, radiographic studies or radiographic imaging and then at the same time, again, everyone is different. There's a lot of uh, variation between people. It can be a functional adaption because of anything you've done in your past, because of sports you play. And then the question is, is it a problem or are you actually benefiting from that? So I wouldn't worry about it at all. Same story with leg length differences. If it's less than one and a half uh, centimeters, it's not a thing. Most people have it. So don't worry about it. All right. How will you plan your treatment who has acute sciatic pain and comes to you with difficulty in walking? So. Uh, I think it's a bit what we said earlier with the acute pain. Uh, what works with sciatica sometimes is uh, the McKenzie approach. So yeah. you can just try and have them uh, perform repeated extension I'll pull up something of like the low yeah of the lower spine of the lumbar spine in prone lying position if the symptoms that your patient experiences in his leg are uh, moving from from peripheral to central so if the movements are centralizing that's uh, called centralization in the McKenzie approach so this is something I prescribe a patient to do a couple of times per day can be done in standing as well um, and for the rest if it's real sciatica from uh, a herniated disc I'd refer back to the general practitioner because um, the general course of a hernia is favorable um, and what those people often need is medication as well because the pain level is pretty high um, so yeah, that that would be my my two options. Yeah, I think there's advice, yeah. a lot of advice to avoid uh, provocating movements as well. Yeah, like the flexion aversion. Mm -hmm. And I think Jared Hall, you can check him out. He did uh, some uh, he did some stuff on 
what he would do with like this acute pain. So, um, you know, involving nerve glides. Yeah, this is all well. faster movement than shown just to fit yeah. the time limit. But, you know, moving into repeated extensions in various positions. Yeah. Um, I think I really like the last one. Uh, yeah. This one. So taking slack off of the yeah. nerve by flexing yeah. the hip and performing the repeated prone extensions. So something like that. I think that's yeah. really cool. So you can he does he does some um, a couple of those for different um, uh, things he sees in the practice. Really sh cool uh, short videos. Yeah. And then you can bookmark them in the bottom right here on Instagram. All right. Should we call it? Let's see. Do you offer placements to students overseas? We do not no, offer placements yeah. yet. <laughs> no, no, it's we work in a really small yeah. practice, so and and we both work part time, so we just don't see enough patients, to be honest. So uh, it would be pretty boring for you. Yeah. Um, okay, Thumbs? Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, it's been a good conversation again with you guys. Um, really like that. I think this had a good flow. Also, no. a good flow in the in the super chat or in the chat on on YouTube, how you guys helped each other out if the question wasn't answered right away. Um, so good to see that input from you. Um, let us know how you liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, write us a message. Write a comment in the in the chat. Um, how you like this um, this first real live stream? How do you like the setup? I think somebody said nice setup. Thank you for that. Uh, what would you like us to include? Maybe you know, give us some ideas. Um, tell us how how this one went. Um, and yeah, I think we answered a, a pretty broad set of of questions. Of course, we see um, questions coming back over and over again. So we we may skip them at at, at some point, but uh, thanks. I think thanks for watching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can add. Yeah. yeah. Or if if your questions uh, weren't answered, uh, because there's quite a, a lot yeah. of questions in the chat, I mean, don't hesitate to just shoot us a message through Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Doesn't matter. Uh, we usually answer pretty quickly. Um, and I mean, this is going to be a thing once a month. That's the plan. Like Andrea said, give us input, so we might all talk about certain topics. Um, but for the rest, this is something we want to offer more often because we enjoy it a lot and we like talking to our uh, followers. And it's it's a two-way street now, yeah. and not so much a one-way street that we produce videos and that's it. Yeah, nothing to add there. So have a great weekend, wherever you may be watching from. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go to the gym now. Kat's gonna go to the gym. <laughs> I'm gonna clean. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Yeah. See you next time. Yeah. Hey, take care. Bye.